Welcome everyone. Welcome Rebecca. How are you doing? That's good. We just went live according to this right here. Hey, I like being live. The alternative is not real good. Oh. Well, I guess it is because it'd be in heaven, wouldn't it? That's right. <laughs> so, is everybody being blessed out there now? I hope. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd encourage you to messages or I guess you can respond there on the comment section on Facebook and you know you can go to Word Life Church well you can go to Pastor Rick Riddle or gmail.com or is there any other way? Twitter or huh? Well talk to him. Tell us ways. All social media we are on. All social media we're on. <laughs> what does that mean exactly? Well we'll have something that's left. Okay. All right, well, you got me on a bunch of that. I mean, I know a little bit, but I'm not a real uh, social media kind of guy. I do a little Facebook here and there. I'm always coming to the point I'm not ready to get off of it altogether. There's a lot of junk, a lot of stuff posted that I don't even need to see or want to hear. You know what I'm saying? Well, share with the people for a few minutes. Talk to them. We're going to do Revelation chapter 7 tonight, so if you get your Bibles, and I'll be sure you get your pen and piece of paper, and we're going to talk about some deep stuff tonight. I like getting deep, don't you? Praise the Lord. I get my iPad up and going. That'll help. If I can, I can always use my iPhone. Or I can get my glasses out and use a Bible. It's all the same. Go ahead and say what's on your heart tonight today. Thank you, Lord, for you to get us going here. So, what do you got in your heart tonight, Rebecca? I put her on the spot at the last minute. She didn't know she was going to be happy for tonight. And what I found, my girls and my wife and several other people, they don't really like to get up here and talk about the book of Revelation and stuff. Because that's something they're not really detailed about, correct? So, I want to talk to you now about some things I think it's vitally important that we understand. Not let ourselves get in fear over what's going on in the world, first of all. Because fear is not of God. Right. Fear is of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Faith's of God. And I, for years, I've been studying, I guess, I got born again in January 1982. So I've almost been born again 36 years. And I've been studying the Bible. I got born again actually reading the book of Revelation. I wasn't even saved when I was reading the book. How I many you know when you read the book of Revelation, you're not even saved, you're not getting no revelation. Yeah. <laughs> because you gotta be spiritual to understand the book of Revelation. You can't just man, you read through third Sunday, you're like, what? What is that even talking about? What are they even saying? You know, and the scripture says you have to spiritually discern. You have to be able to rightly divide the word of God. Second Timothy 2.15. Study show yourself approved the right by work and you need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. So it's our duty as born again believers is to study the Word of God and learn how to rightly divide the Word and make sure that what the Word's saying is what the Word's saying yeah. and not what some religious people have taught us. Because I found a lot of things that I was taught as a kid, it wasn't right. It was very wrong, to be quite honest with you. It taught fear, it taught bondage, it taught. You know, if you can't read the Bible in faith, you're already in trouble because this is not a book of fear. Every time Jesus would appear or angel would appear, appear to people, what would he say? Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. I mean, that's the very first thing he would say. Don't, don't be afraid. Jesus would talk to people. Don't be afraid. Even his disciples said, don't be afraid. Why is that? You were talking about it a little bit last night. 
Fear will draw you away from God. Faith will draw you to Him. When you start asking all these questions about, you know, God, why is this one? You actually will get more darkness coming to you than you will light. Because to go to God, you have to go in faith based on the Word, and then light will come. And a matter of fact, the name of the book, even preachers get the name of, of this book wrong. They say, this is the Revelations. No, it's not. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ to the church and to the believers. And I hear preachers all the time say, let's go to the book of Revelations. No, it's not the book of Revelations. It's a book of Revelation. It was a revelation from Jesus to his servants and through John where you and I can have understanding and insight into what's happening in this hour and that what will happen in this end time. The book of Revelation is one of the most awesome books because it tells us not only what's going to happen, you know, the next seven years, the next hundred years, it tells us the next thousand years. And then it even goes in throughout eternity what's going to be going on. And most people don't even have a clue. There's things in the book of Revelation that bring so much enlightenment that it tells me, and it should tell every believer, that we're living in the last days. I'll just give you one real quick, and then we'll get into this, but uh, Revelation, the 16th chapter, it talks about a 200 million man army. There's never in the history of the world been any nation capable of manning a 200 million man army until the day you and I were born. And China is already boasting that they can man a 200 million man army because there's 1.3 billion people in China. So you think about that. If you that in the end time, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I mean, that's the kings of the east. Now, it won't just be it won't just be China. I mean, you'll have Korea, probably North Korea. You'll probably have the Philippines. You'll have different kings of the east that will actually go down at the end of the tribulation period, the last part of it, to fight at the Battle of Armageddon, which will be in the Valley of Jezreel outside of Jerusalem, which is called the, 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 the Battle of Armageddon or the Valley of Megiddo. That's where they're all going to join up together. There'll be over 200 million people there. They'll be there trying to fight and stop Jesus from returning, which is crazy. It won't happen. And we'll get to that later on in Revelation chapter 20. But what's so awesome to me is God lays this out for us because he don't want us to be ignorant. He wants us to understand what's going to happen. Now, I can't tell you I know everything and I've got everything exactly right. I'm not telling you that at all because I'm still learning. So I have learned some things and I do have some revelation and some insight into some things. And uh, thank God for that. And I believe I'll have more in the upcoming ahead, but I'm not there. You know, I don't know everything. People make an asking questions. I may not be able to answer all your questions. I asked you a question last night. You couldn't answer. What was the question? You don't remember? <laughs> Here's my question. Maybe y'all can answer it out here now or somebody on Facebook. How can a black and white cow eat green grass and get white milk? Because I can't <laughs> But I'm saying, there is a reason that happens, you know, there's a if a scientist was here, they probably could explain all those things to us. I don't know. I don't I don't know that. I can't it didn't make a lot of sense to me. But anyway, that's the way God created it, that's the way it works and that's the way it is. And I trust it, I drink milk. I used to put a little chocolate in it, but I drink milk and I enjoy it. So hey, that's all that matters, right? Let's get into this. We're gonna get into some good stuff. Please, if you have any questions again, put them on Facebook and we'll uh, or anybody here you can ask questions. It says, after these things, I saw four angels. And I better preface this, have you? Yeah, and some of you may not remember this, but last, I guess a couple weeks ago, now we was in Florida. I think, was it last week we were back? Yeah, we were back last week, wasn't it? Yeah. I think we were. Anyway, I don't know. We've been so many places here in the last few weeks. But Revelation chapter 6 is where the tribulation period actually begins. See, there's a lot of people teaching, and I won't name names, but there's some people that are teaching right now. We're already in the tribulation period. Can't be. It's not possible. There's no way. Because we're still here. The tribulation period can't even start until the church is gone. Because, see, if, 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 if the Antichrist, he is waiting for us to be taken out of the way where he can come on the scene. Now, he's probably alive right now somewhere, a very prominent man, probably somewhere in, uh, you know, in Europe, somewhere in those areas over there. He's coming up through the ranks and stuff. He's being prepared. But the bottom line is, as long as we're here, the Antichrist, you don't have to worry about the Antichrist. He can't come on the scene. I've heard people say, well, Ronald Reagan's the Antichrist. I've heard people say, President Obama was the Antichrist. I've heard uh, 
It was who's leading. I've heard, well, who's been dying? Antichrist died. Now, there is many Antichrists. Hitler would have been a great example of an Antichrist. But he was not the Antichrist. The Antichrist cannot come until you and I are out of here. Now, we know in Revelation chapter 4, the church leaves here. We're caught up into heaven. I mean, we're all in the presence of God around the throne. And then we see in, in Revelation chapter 5, who's there? And you see the angels there, the church is there, the fathers there, the sons there, the Holy Spirit's there. You can see it. I mean, it's all in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Revelation chapter 6, there was a question asked, who's worthy to take, I believe it's a scroll, but I believe it was the earth piece that was, you know, God gave to Adam and Eve. Because man's going to be on the earth for 6,000 years. The 7,000 or the seventh day will be the 1,000 year reign of Christ. Think about it. Days is a, a thousand years, a thousand years. Because a day is 1,738. So the bottom line is we are coming down to the end of the sixth day. The seventh day will be the 1,000 year reign of Christ. That's coming. It's soon. I, you know, I'm not setting dates. I'm not saying Jesus is coming next week, next month, next year. Five years. I'm not saying. I don't know. I mean, I believe he'll come in my lifetime, but he may not. And if he doesn't, the computer will. And if he doesn't, then you know, hey, okay, I'll go my way to the grave like, you know, billions of other people have. And I'll go to be with, you know, the Lord Jesus, and I'll go to be there with my family. You know, I shared a little bit last night. You think about it. Right now, there's people. I know more people in heaven than I do here on the earth because I've had the opportunity to meet many, many people over my 35 years of ministry and family. So there's people waiting right now on the other side. So if you leave here today, your family, your friends, the people that's gone on before you, they're there waiting. I, and I shared a little bit about the vision that uh, uh, Sister uh, Lindsay from Christ for Nation, her prayer partner, had when Brother Hagin passed away. She had a vision that when Brother Hagin, when he went into heaven, that all his family was waiting. And, and his friends, and they were like, hey, Brother Hagin's here. And everybody got all excited and stuff. And then you know, they talk about Jesus come walking down and got Brother Hagin, and they all went up and they was having like a reunion. You know, and she was seeing that in the vision. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen. I mean, heaven is a real place. It's more real than this earth. Because everything that you can see here in this earth is created by what you can't see. It was created by God. Who's a spirit? So, heaven, and this is one thing that's so cool about the book of Revelation, and you need to understand this because this will help many of you when you study the book of Revelation. Many things are being told from heaven's viewpoint, other things are told from the earth's viewpoint. And you've got to be able to discern is he talking about what's happening from heaven's viewpoint, or is he talking about what's happening from the earth's viewpoint? Because things are going to be happening during that, that seven-year period known as the, tri the tribulation period. It's going to be absolutely astounding, to be honest with you. There, Jesus said, there's never been at this time as bad as there will be. And there'll never be another time that bad. It's the great tribulation. Which the great rib tribulation really doesn't start until the midpoint of the tribulation period. It's really the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. The first three and a half years, the Antichrist is trying to get his system set up. And he's trying to get all his forces together and trying to make everything happen he needs to make happen. Now, let's get this straight and clear tonight. Satan never controls this entire world, ever. That's been his goal since the fall of Adam and Eve. He's never controlled this entire world, and he'll never control this entire world. Even during the, the seven years of tribulation, he will never control this entire world. And I'll, we'll be able to bring that out. I'll show you in Revelation chapter 13. In different chapters, when we get there in Revelation chapter 16, he never controls this entire earth. He wants to, but he never will. God will never allow him to do it. Let's read. You ready? You want to start out? Verse 1. Uh, now I saw when the Lamb was slain, the four beasts. Are you in Revelation 7? Seven? Seven. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth. Now think about what he just said. Four angels. They've got such power that they're literally stopping the wind from blowing on the earth. That's amazing when you just think about that when it's said. Those are some powerful beings. Mm -hmm. 
Go ahead. Not blow on her, or the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Now, understand this. This is midpoint, right at the midpoint of the tribulation period. The church has already been caught up. The church is already in heaven. People have been living here on this earth, and they've been struggling. I mean, there's, there's bad things happening here. The Antichrist is setting up his system. The first three and a half years of the tribulation period won't be super bad. I mean, because think about it. He's going to sign a peace treaty with the nation of Israel for seven years. And, I mean, you know, he's going to be being like he's a real nice guy. And, you know, he's just wonderful. You know, he's making a covenant with them and stuff. And I mean, he's wooing the people. He's, he's getting nations to follow him. He's getting people to go along with what he wants to do. And he'll have, you know, a lot of solutions to a lot of the earth's problems and a lot of the world's problems. People say, man, that's a great idea. I don't know why we've never done this before. A lot of people are going to go along with what he's doing because they'll have to choose to follow him. Just like right now, you have to choose to follow Jesus. Go ahead, read on. Now, here's again, a lot of people start reading this and they say, well, you know, we're talking about sealing the foreheads. This must be the church. No, this is not talking about the church. We're fixing to find out who he's talking about here in just a minute. But notice what, what, what the Lord said. He said, do not harm the trees, the grass, the sea. Don't harm anything until the seal of God is put in these folks. Let's see who these folks are. Uh, verse 4 says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed. One hundred and forty four thousand of all these tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Now, let's talk. There is a religious group out there. If I was to say it to them, who they are. They believe only 144,000 is all going to heaven. Now, guys, think, there's 7 billion people on the earth right now. If there's only 144,000 people that's going to heaven, whoa, boy, <laughs> we got a problem here. You know what I'm saying? And I'll just say it. It's the Jehovah Witnesses. They believe there's only 144,000 people that will go to heaven. Everybody else, they give you like an animal. And you die, you go in the grave, you go to sleep, and that's it. It's over. That's what they believe. That's what they teach. I had, well, you were there the other day. I was at uh, McKinney, Texas at Cole, sitting in the parking lot reading my Bible and praying, and I saw a gentleman pull up behind me, and he walks around and comes over to me and starts trying to witness to me, you know, Jehovah Witness. Found out he's from Romania. And after he left, I witnessed to him for probably 45 minutes and told him things that just, I just blew his mind. I mean, he'd never heard some of the things I talked to him about. You know, he started talking to me, and I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you know, you Jehovah Witness, you believe there's only 144,000 people going to heaven? You know, it's going to rise to this God status or whatever one day? I said, which tribe are you from? He looked at me like, what do you mean? I said, well, Revelation chapter 7 says that there's 144,000, but they're all Jews. They're from the 12 tribes. There's 12,000 from each tribe. I said, which tribe are you from? He was afraid. He was like, oh, what? I said, man. Have you never read the Bible? Oh, yeah. He said, I have. I said, well, I'm telling you, that's what the scripture says, man. I said, they're all Jewish. Every one of them. The whole 144,000 are all Jewish people. What tribe are you from? I said, if there's only 144,000 going to go to heaven, what are you even doing out here witnessing in the first place? Because you're probably not going to be one of them. <laughs> I mean, think about it. If there's only 144,000, it's going to be good enough to make it. And there's 7 billion people on the earth? That's crazy. What's the use? I mean, I'm just saying, what is the use? But see, if we study this again, if you keep your scriptures in context, and if you let the Bible interpret other scriptures, you'll find out real quick, that's not what it's saying at all. Read a little bit further. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed, 
12,000 were still, but of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were still. And we can go through them all. There's 12 tribes, and the bottom line is there's 12,000 out of each tribe. That's 144,000. Who's being sealed? Let's talk for a minute. This is important stuff, and I'm going to take some time here. I'm not going to get going so fast and skip some things here. There's 144,000 that are all Jews. There's 12 tribes. There's 12,000 in each tribe. This angel is coming to put the seal of God on their forehead. Now, if I had time, I'd know tonight, but I'm going to show you the Jets now. But we'll get to it when we get to Revelation chapter 14, I believe it's verse 2. These are all men, and they're all virgins. They're not married. And here's the reason why. Because this 144,000 Jewish people, men, are going to spend the first three and a half years of the tribulation period preaching the gospel. That's what's going to happen. That's the reason the seal of God is going to be in their forehead. Nothing will be able to hurt them. Nothing will be able to stop them. Nothing will be able to hinder them from carrying out God's word and God's will in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. That's the reason there's going to be a massive amount of people be born again after you and I are already out here. Can I give you a scripture? Uh, you're in your, well, I'm not going tonight. Uh, go with me real quick to Matthew. See, you got to tie the scriptures together with all these things. You can't just, you know, pull a couple things out of context and make it say what you want to say. Matthew 24. Now, we know Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 6, they parallel each other. They're both talking about the same events. And they're both talking to Jesus, talking about the same thing. Matthew chapter 24 and in, in Revelation chapter 6. You can read them side by side and you can see they're talking about, Jesus is talking about the same thing. But look at this. In Matthew 24, verse 14. And listen to what it says. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and then the end will come. Everybody see that? See, we started preaching the gospel on the day, you know, after Jesus was resurrected. I mean, Peter went out, you know, a couple of days later after the day of Pentecost. So he preached man and, and 3,000 people got born again. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And then they, they preached some more. And I think later on, there's 4,000 got born again. And we've been preaching the gospel ever since. Over 2,000 years, we've been preaching the gospel. And people are still getting saved. They've been saved by the billions. We don't get to finish this. We're going to be caught up in the process. Sometime in the near future, the church is going to be caught up. Well, God's not going to just turn this earth over to the devil and say, okay, you know, everybody's out of here. Now everybody else can go to hell. No. God never turns this earth over to Satan to send everybody to hell. It never happens. We've been taught because people didn't understand. God's a loving God. And you're going to find when we get on into this, even in the end of the tribulation period, for the first time in the world's history, in the eternity, as far as I know, the angels will actually preach the gospel. They've never before. But at the end, they will preach the gospel to people. And it is amazing. It says that the angel went throughout the heavens and proclaimed to people the good news. It says men still won't repent. They'll still blaspheme God. But see, they still have a choice. Now, what's happening here, it says, it says that this gospel will be, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. See, we've thought for years, and I've taught this for years, that we as a church, we've got to get the gospel around the world. As soon as we get the gospel all the way around the world, Jesus is going to catch us up. Well, we have pretty much got the gospel all the way around the world, to be quite honest with you. Through television, satellite, DVD, MP4s, MP3s, I mean, every way you can think of it. We were in Haiti a few years ago. I think it was 2000. We held a crusade there. You know, there were probably two, three thousand 3,000 people showing up at night. I mean, we're preaching, laying hands on. I mean, you know, and, and, and after we would leave, they would turn on the Jesus video and show them the movie Jesus, which was really cool. I mean, I thought that was wonderful. So, I mean, we were reaching out to people. I mean, uh, my mother-in-law was there. Her brother was there. I mean, there were several people that were with it. It was awesome. I mean, you just wonder what God was doing. But the bottom line is, once you and I are caught up, God never turns this earth over to Satan. He just takes his 144,000 Jews 
He puts a seal of God in their forehead. They're totally sold out to God. They don't have wives and stuff. So, I mean, they're sold out to preaching the gospel during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. And that's what they're going to do. That's what their calling is. That's what they know they're here for. And that's exactly what they're going to do. And I tell you, they're going to turn this world right side up. I mean, there are going to be masses of people who are going to get born again. The backsliders, the people that's out there right now, it's not living for God and got left behind. They're going to know what happened was the church is gone. The church will be full, man, the day after the catching up with the rapture. The church will be full. I mean, people will be there crying and weeping. And, and you know, they're going to go through some tough things in the clouds. You know. But the bottom line is they still can be born again. They can still, you know, they may have to give up their life. They may even lose their head, but they still get to go to heaven. So, read a little further. Back in Revelation chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, right past that. Start with the verse there. Uh, verse 9. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Now, hang on, hang on. This is amazing, man. This is the harvest. It was 144,000 Jewish people a week during the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Now, if you write in your Bible, and I hope you do, if you're taking notes, I want you to write down Zechariah 8.23, and I'll go there. And you can go there, too, if you want to. Make sure it's in there. I, I, I don't know. Zechariah 8.23. This has never happened before. This will happen during the tribulation period. Right at the beginning, up to the midpoint. It says in Zechariah 8 23, Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Massive harvest. Massive harvest. Because they'll see the power and the anointing that's on this 144,000 Jewish evangelists that's going to preach the gospel during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. It's going to be wonderful. Man. It's going to be wonderful. I mean, people are going to be going to these guys. They're going to be born again. Read on. breaks his agreement with Israel. Write down Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Tribulation saints, the Jews and Gentiles caught up and escaped the wrath of the Antichrist. This is what we just read, Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. And they also escaped the mid-tribulation wrath of God. How many you know the scripture tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, we have not been appointed unto the wrath of God. The born again believers. That's the reason the tribulation period didn't even take place in you and I are called. It says, and uh, here's another one, Revelation 8, 5, we'll get into it in a minute. It says there'll be an upheaval of nature. These are things that happen in mid-tribulation. Antichrist moves against Israel, the remnant of Israel hidden away, 
Again, that's Daniel 9, 27. That's Matthew 24, 15 through 21. That's Mark 13, chapter verse 14 through 20. And Revelation 11, 2. And Revelation chapter 12, verse 13 through 17. These are just some of the things that's going to happen with men for the tribulation. And, and I mean, this is, I'm just giving you a few of them. I mean, there's many more out here. Then what's going to happen, the Antichrist will destroy the religious system of the world church. And you'll find that in Revelation chapter 17, verses 16 through 18. And then here's another great one. The Antichrist, according to 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, verses 3 and 4, he'll go in and declare that he's God into the temple at midpoint of the tribulation period. Well, the Jewish people, the remnants that's left behind that didn't get caught up at midpoint of the tribulation period, they're going to realize, man, this ain't God. And they're going to flee. Many believe they'll flee to a place called Petra. There, there's, a, there's a place that God has for them that they will flee to and that nobody will be able to hurt them. They'll be protected during the last part of the tribulation period. And again, we'll get into that when we get to, you know, Revelation chapter 11. We'll get into you know, starting deeper into these things. We're just kind of laying the foundation right now. So, read the next verse. These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of blood. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And my suggestion to you is I don't have time to go into this or not. We're going to try to get into the 8th chapter also the Revelation. Go to Revelation chapter 14 and it goes into much more detail about this 144,000 Jewish people. And it tells you more about it than it does in Revelation chapter 14. Alright, you ready to go to, to chapter 8? I'll start reading. This is where the seven seals. Now, remember, Jesus took the scroll in, in Revelation chapter 6 out of the Father's hand. And he opened the first seal. The first seal was a man on a white horse. Was, 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 that was the Antichrist. Again, he can't even be released and even come on the scene to you and I right now. Then, what was the second seal? Anybody remember? A man on a red horse. War was released. It'll actually be World War III. You'll find it in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Russia, Turkey, uh, Iran, Iraq, Yemen, uh, who else is there? There's several different countries will go down Ethiopia and they will try to invade Israel. And God literally says he will put a hook like in their jaws and pull them back and they literally will be wiped out. It says there will only be a sixth part of them left. Now, there will probably be nuclear weapons involved in that because if you see in Ezekiel 39, you get over there, it starts talking about the fire. That was released and stuff. And God sends great hell. There'll be some earthquakes. There'll be some things that happen where God will literally intervene, just like He has throughout history for the nation of Israel. Because if you go to Daniel, the 12th chapter, I believe it's verse 1 and 2, it talks about that Michael, the archangel, his assignment is to watch over the nation of Israel. Anybody ever heard of the Six Day War? Anybody? It's amazing if you go back and look at the history of this, of the Six Day War, when all the Arab nations around Israel tried to invade them and kill them and push them into the sea. Man, they had the finest Russian tanks. They had the finest Russian artillery that there was at that time. And they would shoot at the armies of Israel, and the, and the, the tanks would miss. Their projectiles would miss. They would miss. Well, when the Israelis would take over those tanks and get in those tanks, and it means. What do you think was happening? There was angels, man, out there making sure these things wouldn't, wouldn't happen, man, that they're not going to destroy Israel. If anybody silly enough tonight thinks that Israel's going to be destroyed, you don't know what you're talking about. Israel's not going anywhere. Israel's here to stay. Now, does that mean that we don't care? We don't pray? No, we pray. We care. We support. We bless. But the bottom line is, Israel's not going anywhere. See, let me help you. God made covenant with Israel all the way back in Genesis. So if Satan could ever annihilate Israel and kill off the Jewish people, he just destroyed the covenant. 
Well, now God's word is no good now. So everything would just be annihilated. So what is what is Satan trying to do all these years? He's trying to destroy Israel. Think about it. What happened when, when Moses was born? In his time. What were they doing? They were making all the women kill all the male babies. Well, what did they say? Moses, no, we're not doing this. His parents said no. Put him in like a little float, a little boat. And then amazing how God worked and took him right to uh, 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 Pharaoh's, you know, sister or whatever. And he ended up, you know, she raised him, but she got his mom. And his mom was the one that fed him, breastfed him, Moses and stuff, man, and raised him up. Think what I'm saying to you. Well, what happened? He delivered. He took them out. But it was prophesied 430 years before it ever happened. God told Joseph when he went in there, he said, they're going to abuse you and your people. He said, I'll raise up a deliverer. He said, I'll bring him in. And what you're going to find when we get on this deeper over the next few weeks, many of the very same plagues that Moses used and controlled, turning water into blood, sent them. Very, those very same plagues happen in the book of Revelation. The two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, they have authority over those plagues during the whole three and a half, or actually seven years, all the way through the tribulation period. They have authority over those plagues. They will be coming out every day in Jerusalem, holding a press conference probably, and telling the Antichrist, oh, I'm going to tell you, Antichrist, you got one day less than you did yesterday. <laughs> Jesus is coming back. Oh, such and such time. Y'all look at me weird. What do you think is going to be happening? It says that they have a hedge of protection around them, and if anybody tries to come against those two witnesses or two prophets, it says they'll be speaking fire come out of their mouth and consume them. Nothing will be able to hurt those two men of God all the way through the tribulation period up until the last three and a half days of the tribulation period. And right before the last three and a half days of the tribulation period, the Antichrist will kill them. And they'll lay in the street. They just leave their bodies laying in the street for three and a half days. Well, on that third day, the Antichrist thinks he's God. He's got a war and Satan thinks he's God. Something happens on that third day. Them two men stand up on their feet. It says every eye will see this happen. Boy, this will be good when we get to the end. Every eye will see this happen, but it's the last day of the tribulation period. But it's also the first day of the thousand year reign of Christ. And as these two guys are rising up in front to, to go up into the clouds to meet Jesus, the cameras are going to be raising up, and guess who they're going to see coming? Jesus on a white horse. And the armies of heaven, all of us with them, coming back to where? We're coming back to the Valley of Gath. We're coming back to Jerusalem. And it says Jesus will literally, this is Revelation chapter 19, Jesus will just speak the word out of his mouth, and their flesh will just literally fall off their bones. Ain't gonna be no pull out those swords and fight. No. He's just gonna speak the word. Bang. It's over. It says that there'll be 200, over 200 million people there. It says that blood will be up to the horses will ride. That's how deep blood will be in places. It's amazing. All these things are all laid out in the book of Revelation. It's all here for us to understand. It's all here for us to study out and see. Then what happens? We come back and healing waters, it says that very day, Zechariah 14. That very day, healing waters start coming out from Jerusalem. Jesus sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem. You and I are right there with him. We've come to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Satan, it says, is bound in a bottomless pit. His throne, an angel. Jesus doesn't even do it. Just an angel. Goes down and wraps him up in a chain, kicks his rear end over in a bottomless pit. Now, how would you like to be like he's fallen for a thousand years? That would be a horrible feeling. That's what's going to happen to him for a thousand years. Antichrist, false prophet, they go into the lake of fire. Everybody else is dead. It's in hell. They stay there. Now you think about it. For a thousand years, you and I are going to be on this earth with Jesus ruling and reigning. There's going to be natural people that went right through the tribulation period. Many died. Many died. Probably maybe as many as a couple of billion people are going to die. But many will go right in to the thousand year reign as a natural man, a natural woman. There's no death during that thousand years. Satan's not here. There's no sickness, there's no disease. Now evidently, according to Isaiah, a child died a hundred, so evidently natural people must still be able to have an accident and die. 
But we won't. We have a glorified body. We will be here ruling and reigning with Jesus for that thousand years. It's amazing what's happening. And most Christians don't have a clue about any of this stuff. I said they don't have a clue about any of this stuff. And that's what gets me. Most Christians don't understand it. What you do in this life will determine what you'll do throughout eternity. Your rewards will be based on your faithfulness in doing what God called you to do in this life. You will be rewarded for those things. You will be given crowns. You will be given garments. And the more crowns and the more garments you have, the more authority you'll have. The more responsibility you'll have during the thousand year reign and throughout eternity. Uh, everybody says, well, I thought we were all going to be the same. We are all going to be the same. We are all going to have glorified bodies. If you're, if you're a part of the church, it's a glorious, wonderful thing. But people will be rewarded for their faithfulness. And see, that's what Christians don't understand. God is a covenant God. He blesses and loves and rewards people according to their faithfulness. You talked about it last night. It wasn't that God wanted Satan to, to kill Job's family and destroy his family and stuff. Job opened the door because of fear. Job 3.25. It's pretty obvious. Boy, can I go there a moment? Oh, I'm teaching on fear Sundays. I'm going to let you go there for a second. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Now hold your place because we're going right back. Let's see. Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall hear all things. Everybody say that. He who overcomes shall hear all things. Do you want to hear all things? Yeah. Then you've got to be an overcomer. Yeah. How are you going to be an overcomer? According to 1 John 5, 4 and 5, you, our faith is a victory that overcomes the world. Our faith in Jesus is what he's done for us. He said, I will be his God and he shall be my son. But look at verse 8. This is New Testament. But the cowardly are the fearful. Everybody say the fearful. fearful. Unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall what? Have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second day. Notice the first thing he said? Cowardly, fearful. Don't tell me fear is not something you need to destroy like you would a snake. I'm telling you, fear is serious business. Because fear takes you away from God, detaches you to the enemy. It gives the enemy right to operate in your life. We need to understand these things. God doesn't take these things lightly and think, oh, it's okay, sweetheart. Little fear's good for you. Where did you find that? It's certainly not in the Word of God. Nowhere is that in the Word of God. Anyway, I think we can get off that. Better be mine. Where did I stop? Where were we at? Revelation 1? We were in Revelation 8, what? Y'all help me, man. Okay, let's go back to verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And y'all know the joke there, right? I said y'all know the joke there, right? Y'all never heard a joke like that? The people say, well, women can't be in heaven. And there ain't no way they can be silent for 30 minutes. <laughs> I don't believe that. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. That's, that's the old joke. So anyway, when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Think about this, man. The plagues and things that's about to come, the wrath of God that's about to be released is so horrific and so horrible that there's silence in heaven for 30 minutes. I get goosebumps just talking about it. This is amazing stuff. I mean, God doesn't want to be God. God is a just God. 
and he has to deal with weakness. Man brought it on themselves. It isn't that God wants to do these things, but it has to be dealt with. This earth has to be cleansed. That's the reason at the White Throne Judgment, this earth will be renovated by fire. We won't be at the White Throne Judgment unless we're there judging. And, and the people think, what? We need to be in our judgment. I'm telling you, we our sins have already been judged. We, it's under the blood. We're not at the White Throne Judgment. Because the people at the White Throne Judgment, if their name's not found right in the book of life, they're going to go into the lake of fire. Hell's going into the lake of fire. Death's going into the lake of fire. So we're not there to be judged or anything of that nature. So and has somebody help me look at uh, somebody look at uh, I don't know if it's first Corinthians or second Corinthians, I believe it's the sixth chapter, verses one, two, three. He talks about that we will judge angels. Somebody find that, please. I don't know. I wouldn't turn to it, but anyway. I'll keep talking to you until I get out of these things. So when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about half an hour. And I saw the seven, seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Did they find it? Second Corinthians 6 3. Read it, please. Then do you not know that you shall judge angels? Go ahead, do verse 3. How much more things that pertain to this life? See, you have authority in this life. And just like you just read there by the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, what does what verse 1 say? Verse 1 says, Their union in heaven matters against another. Will the law before them like to be or not before them like to be? There you go. And then he said, he said, don't you take your brother or your sister to court and, and, and have a lawsuit and all that? And he said, you take them before the church. It should be dealt with in the church. He said, you're going to judge angels. You can't even judge these little affairs. That's how big, that's how much, got to be careful about it. <laughs> that's where we have such babies in the body of Christ that need to grow up. They can't get over their emotions, their feelings, their strife, and they don't understand it. Those are the very thing that's sucking the life out of them because they let offense, they let strife come. And get them out of love. And my Lord, my God, one day we're going to judge. We're going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus on this earth for a thousand years. I mean, you've got to become spiritually mature enough that you can handle some things. But I don't care. You start doing something God, people will start talking some trash about you. They don't like you. Who cares? Why should that bother you? If somebody's talking bad about you or thinking bad about you, Lord, why should that bother you? They're saying something nasty about you on Facebook. Who cares? Unless it's true. Now, if it's true and you're a liar and you're a thief and you're a, you know, a drunk and a fornicator, then yeah, I might hurt. But if it's just a lie, who cares? Because anybody that really knows you, they know that ain't true. They know that way. They, they would never do that. They'd never act like that. They'd, they'd never do something like that. They'd never say anything like that. Am I telling you the truth? You know me. You've been around me for what, 30 years almost? Do I sit around talking about people's stuff? No. Why? Why should I sit around talking about you? I'd be a small minded person if all I did sit around talking about you. I'm very limited in my life and what I can do if all I do is sit around talk about somebody else. Small minded people talk about people. Average-minded people talk about events and things, but visionary people talk about the things of God and what's coming, where we're going. This is where we're headed. They see beyond what's going on in the natural, and they don't let things distract them and get them off the wall. See, the, 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 there was people coming to Nehemiah when they were rebuilding the wall, trying to get Nehemiah to come down. Well, they had a plot. If he came down, he was going to kill him. And he said, I don't have time to come down. I'm rebuilding the wall. So you should be so focused on what God calls you to do. You ain't got time. I, man, they got to come and talk to y'all. I ain't got time to do the ministry. I mean, we, we got vision here. We got things we got to make happen. We ain't got time to come down and, you know, deal with this silliness. Does that make sense? The Lord dropped this in my heart 
long time ago. So if you're in the free zone, you have anybody say it, you get upset and say, if you can't see and have vision from God, you'll never be able to do his will. If you can't thank God for something before you have it, you'll never have it. See, if, if you're always thinking poverty and lack, and, you know, we can't afford this, you're never going to the palace. You can't live in the palace thinking like a, a pauper. It don't work that way. I mean, you you got to realize, hey, I'm a child of God. I'm an heir of God. I'm a son of God. This is all mine. This is my life. I'm supposed to have this. I'm supposed to be living this. I'm supposed to be driving this. It's supposed to be debt free. It's already mine. It's not going to be. See, you get a revelation of that, now you start thinking different. Now you're not trying to think about, oh, you know, I owe the boys, what, $500,000 or, you know, 6% interest. Or, you know, no. I love what Jesse McClellan's statement he made. It's a revolution I believe I think. He said, God never told me I had to pay for it. He told me I need to believe for it. Right. <laughs> hey, that takes all the pressure off. Yeah. I don't have to pay for it. I just got to believe for it. Yeah. What's that mean? That means I can have anything I can believe God for. Right. And I don't have to come up with the money to get it. Right. God can send it to me. God can actually give it to me. God can just say, there it is. Take it, boy. He'll give me a creative idea where I can make the money. Whatever. I mean, it's up to him. I don't have to figure all this stuff out. All I have to do is believe. And I have to speak what I believe. And I have to move in that direction. And I can't let everybody talk me out of it. Because people get mad at you. When you start becoming successful, people get mad. Well, bless God, you ought to give some of that money to the poor. Well, let me ask you, how much you give to the poor? And we should give to the poor. I'm not going to say it up. But I'm saying, say, how much are you giving? It is amazing to me how the news media attacks preachers all the time. And a lot of those guys are sitting there making $8 billion a year reading a stinky teleprompter. What are you doing that's so important? You know how to read. Wonderful. You get paid $8 billion because you can read. That's crazy. And they have the audacity to attack a man or a woman of God that's winning people into the kingdom of God. It's people keeping people going to hell. It's getting people healed. Do you have the audacity to talk about him? Shh. They don't repent. I hate to be in their shoes one day when they do stand at that white throne judgment. Or they do stand at the beam and seat of judgment seat of Christ. I just wouldn't want to be in their shoes. I mean, they made it. If they're up there at the beam and seat of Jesus. But the bottom line is, I don't know how pleased he's going to be with some things because a lot of Christians do. Oh, I did wrong. I didn't care what it is. So I'm like a, I'm like a, a, a horse at the shoot. Oh, oh, I'm ready to take off. Over to the gate. Let me out. <laughs> we got a whole bus that back there. Hold back there. Whoa. Oh. All right. Oh, yeah. Verse three. <laughs> then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense mm -mm -mm, that he should offer it with the what? Prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne of God. In the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints. Everybody say the prayers of the saints. This is awesome. Ascended before God from the angel's hand. You think God ain't hear what you're praying? He knows exactly what you're praying. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for you now. Saying, Father, I paid the price for that. Give it to me. Um, they're asking me my part. They're asking what I want. So grant it. Can you go wrong with Jesus to play with you? <laughs> I mean, seriously. The only way you could lose is if you quit. That's the only way you lose. You got Jesus praying for you, you got angels here ministering and helping. You've got the fivefold ministry here. You've got your other brothers and sisters in the church that's praying for you, that's here to help you, to encourage you. The only way you can lose is if you quit. 
If you get offended and let somebody make you mad, oh, no, I'm not going back down there. They're not nice. They don't shake my hand. That's all you need. I'll shake your hand. But you're not very mature. If you can allow, and if you let somebody chase you off in the church, you're a very immature person. I'm just being honest with you. If you allow Satan to chase you away across the fence, you're a very immature. You're going to have to grow up. That's what's going to happen. You're going to run down the street. Somebody's going to beat you down the street. You're going to run down to the little fella down the street. And somebody's going to bend you down there. And you're going to go through life emotionally like a roller coaster, up and down, defending about every little thing. you got to grow up. So let's be honest. Here's what you do. Here's what you say. I didn't believe it. I was supposed to be here. You couldn't let me up. Wild horses couldn't drag me away from you. Are you hearing me? But you've got to be committed. And that's a very, probably dirty word in the body of Christ today. It's the word commitment and faithfulness. There's very few that are really committed and really faithful. And that's the reason they never get the supernatural breakthrough that they need in life and they never get. Anyway, that doesn't help you, God. I can rely on saying that. He said in verse five, then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. Wow. And there were noises, thunderings, lightning, and an earthquake. Boy, there is going to be lots of earthquakes, folks. <coughs> I hope you hear what I'm saying to you. There's going to be lots of earthquakes during the tribulation period. There's going to be one so great at the end of the tribulation period, it's going to level out of mind. Now, We've had some major earthquakes over the years. We've never had nothing that we thought about leveling the table in mind. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, boy, we're just getting some fun stuff. Then the first angel sounded. It's not fun. I mean, it's serious, but I'm saying it's a good word. The first angel sounded, and hell and fire followed, followed mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. Wow. Now listen to this very important. You hear these next few verses. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all the grass was burned up. There's a, 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 a gentleman on television now on radio. He says this has already happened. This happened in World War II. How I many of that's pulling stuff out of context, but that's not true. Okay, here's why. Let me show you. It said what? The first thing was saying. Is that not fun? Patty, Siri, you better settle down, Daniel. I see you better settle down. I'll talk trash to her all the time. Freak her out. The first angel sounded, and hell and, and hell and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up. Everybody say a third of the tree. And all grass was burned up. Now, then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. Hey, that's never happened. That's never happened before. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and here's where he takes this one verse and pulls it out of context. And a third of the ships were destroyed. He said, that's what happened in World War II, is a third of the ships were destroyed. Yeah, there was. I'm sure there was. You probably go back and research. There probably was a third of the ship destroyed. But there wasn't a third of everything the sea destroyed. And a third of the sea was not turned into blood. So you can't take a one little part of a scripture out of context and say, this is already happening. No, it's not. It hasn't even thought about even starting yet. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. That's going to be a meteorite or something. I mean, I don't know, but it could be. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on a third of the, of the springs of water. Listen, the name of the water is Wormwood. And there's a gentleman, he's a prophecy preacher, very well known. I said his name, all of you know who he is. Well, not maybe all of you, most of you. And he says, well, if you take this word in the Russian language and you use the word Wormwood, it, it's Chernobyl. Well, we know what happened in Chernobyl. I mean, some of you, some of you. But Chernobyl, there was a nuclear meltdown back in the 80s. And 
I mean, it killed. Oh, everybody knows that it killed the radiation fallout from it. But uh, again, you can't pull something out of context and say, this is nuclear fallout or radiation. All we know is there's something happens that turns the water to that are poisonous. And when men drink them, they get sick or they die. Now you know what? <laughs> okay. Settle down. Put, put the horse back in the yoke. World War III, at the beginning of the tribulation period, when Russia's destroyed, there'll be nuclear weapons involved. So there's going to be probably some radiation fallout in the atmosphere from that. We know that there's things going to be happening here on this earth. Heat will intensify during the tribulation period. It'll be much hotter. But the problem is, there's not good water to drink in certain areas. Now, not all over the world. Really, if you want to look at this and really study this out, only the Antichrist operation is really only operating in about a fourth of the world. Over in the European area, over in the Middle East area, and those areas where he's going to be operating, that's where most of these things are going to be. Now, again, that don't mean things aren't going to happen here, because they are. And, and there are going to be bad things everywhere. But what I'm saying to you is, it's not going to be worldwide, because everybody's not going to be dead. Where is this 200 million man army coming from? The east. They're coming. Well, they got to have water to be able to get down into the valley of the ghetto at the end of the tribulation period. Now, the video will have wolves and stuff all over. They're, and when we get to Revelation chapter 16, it talks about there'll be such pain, and people will be in such torment, and they'll chew their own tongue up. Because there won't be the meds and things that we have today to be able to, you know, ease pain and all that kind of stuff. There'll be boils, literally, on their skin. There's a time coming, and we're going to, I think, next week, that there'll be demonic things will be loosed on this during the tribulation period, will be loosed during the last part of the tribulation period. It's like locusts that will sting and torment men for five months. And it says that men are such torment, they're wanting to die, and they can't. Death flees from them. This is what's coming. Now, many of these people that these things are happening to are the ones that took the mark of the beast. And they perceive that the mark of the Antichrist, a lot of people believe it's a chip. I don't know. I'm not going to argue with people about any of that. I would more say it's probably a chip than a mark. But I don't know. I mean, look at all the animals with chips. Now people are chipping their children. I mean, it's becoming a well-known practice in Switzerland and places like that. A lot of people in factories are taking it. They want it. Oh, they want the chip. Again, that's not the mark of the beast yet, but it can be. But, I mean, they want it because it makes it ease for them. They can keep all their records on it and stuff, and they can get into the, the facilities, and they don't need their cards and all the security and all that stuff. Again, I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying there's a time coming that Satan will try to control the whole world through this mark because if you don't have this chip mark, whatever it is, you won't be able to buy and sell. You won't be able to buy anything. You won't be able to do any kind of transaction in a grocery store or anywhere else during the last part of the tribulation period unless you take that mark. Now think about that. That's serious business. I mean, if you didn't go during the kitchen of the church, you didn't go at mid-truth when the 144,000 and their converts were, were caught up, then you're stuck here for the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. And there'll be natural people, like I said, that went right through and went and missed the, the catch up turf, went right into the, to the tribulation period. They'll be having babies. You know, they come down to it. They said, listen, if you don't take this, this mark, you know, we're going to cut your baby's head off. What do you think a lot of people are going to do? Oh, I know they say, oh, I'd never. You let them start cutting your baby's head off. See what you do. And the sad thing about it is Revelation chapter 14 says if you take that mark, that you're born to hell. There is no turning back. What you do? You made a choice. You chose it. If you do it, and we'll get into that in a few weeks. I got to close. What time is it? Oh, it is. It says a third of the waters became wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was bitter, a poison. Then the fourth angel sent, and a third of the sun was struck. Listen to this. A third of the sun was struck. A third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of them were darkened. So now you got dark. A third of the day did not shine and likewise at night. Why do you think that's happening? Because of all the heat and all the nuclear radiation and all the fallout and all the things. If God didn't shorten 
the, the sunlight and stuff, many people were born even more people died. I mean, because of the heat, because of all, you think about what did we have temperatures for 100, 105, 108? Can you imagine maybe 120 in Texas? Air conditioning came in. Can it? I mean, here you are, man. You got 120 degrees outside. You have no water, but you think it's good. It's all just poison. So now you're sitting here sweating like an animal. No word to give. It's not going to be a good situation. Well, but by the way, if you're born a new believer, you're going to be in heaven. You're going to be up there receiving your rewards. You're going to be up there learning how to rule and reign with Jesus. You're going to be up there learning how to operate in a glorified body. Isn't that going to be wonderful? I said, Isn't that going to be wonderful? Hallelujah. Don't tell me it don't pay to serve God. It pays big time. He said, Verse 13, and I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, listen, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. There's only three trumpets left, and he's saying it's fixing to get a lot worse. An angel going through that. Think about it. And I said this earlier, but I'll say it one more time. Angels have never been able to preach the gospel before. You remember in the Acts of 10 chapter when uh, the angel appeared to Cornelius and he didn't preach to him. The angel said, send men to get Simon Peter and he'll tell you the way of salvation. He'll tell you how to be born again. So he sent men to go get Simon Peter. And Simon Peter come in and told them how to get born again. They all got born again, got filled with the Spirit, and prayed in tongues. The angel didn't get to preach the gospel. There's time coming at the last part of the tribulation period, right before the end of it all. The angels will actually finally get to preach the gospel. See, God's still merciful, even at the very end, when I mean it's almost wrapped up. God still has mercy. He's still saying, Repent, come to me. And men are blaspheming and cursing because of the things they're going through, which it wasn't God's will for them to have to go through anyway. He tried to deliver them all the way through, and they would never listen. Rebellious men. See, Romans chapter 1, we get a chance y'all to read it. Many people during that period of time are going to be getting on to a reprobate mind. They will hate God. And that's kind of where we're at right now. And again, I'm going to say this and get a lot of sense. That's where we have homosexuality and stuff. People been turned, been, been turned over to a reprobate mind. And they don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, there's something wrong with it. Why is there something wrong with that? Well, it's the worst than adultery and fornication. But the bottom line is God said, no, it's an abomination. Don't do it. That's God. And see, you don't tell God the way he does and what he's going to do. He knows what's right. And he knows what you and I should do, and he gives us instruction how to do it. And then the cool thing about it is, he not only gives us instruction how to do it, he rewards us for doing it. Isn't that sweet? That's how much he loves us. He rewards us for doing what he tells us to do. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that what your boss does for you? You do what they tell you to do on your job. Well, they give you a piece of paper at the end of the week. It's called a paycheck. He said, thank you. How many of you are interested in dying today, man? There ain't no way I'm doing that. Well, then it had you another piece of paper. It'd be pink. And it'd say, get out of here. We don't need you. You know what I'm saying to you? Well, it's the same way with God. Why is it that we think we can just do anything we want to, anybody we want to, and oh, God's going to bless me? No, it don't work that way. Will God forgive you? Certainly he'll forgive you if you'll be serious and repent. And if you'll really repent. See, crying don't mean you repent. Crying usually just means I got caught, you know, and I feel sorry about it. Give me a chance, I'll do it again. <laughs> Repent means you stop it. You turn away from it. You go a different direction. And you don't go back down that path. I saw a gentleman the other day that said, you know, God delivered me from alcohol and drugs in January 1982. 
If I was going back and drink and do it till I did, it'd be like a dog that turned into a bomb. I've been delivered from it, man. I wouldn't be, why would I go back to the world and the trash of the world when I've been set free? I got set free in 1983 from smoking cigarettes. Hallelujah to the glory of heaven. It was a wonderful day. In a church service, can you imagine that? I was sitting there, and the pastor was, there's probably 2,000 people there that night, and the pastor was walking around, and he was like, some of you people smoke in here. He said, I can smell it. <laughs> he looked, he's going down the front row, you smoke? Do you smoke? Do you smoke? And people were like, no. <laughs> and the other was like, he said, well, where's your cigarette? Oh, there's a purse. He said, well, get them and go to the front. And I was just getting all around me. I mean, I was a very timid, shy young guy. You know, I mean, I was very timid. I didn't want to be in front of nobody. I didn't want to be in front of people. He was getting all around me in the corner. And I'm like, God, please just don't let it get to me. I said, when he prays a prayer, I'll receive and I'll, I'll stop. I'll quit. I won't smoke again. I'll receive my deliverance. And it was probably that night. He never called me out. He got all around me, but he never called me out. And when he prayed that prayer, I did what I said. I, I honored my word. I said, Lord, that's it. I come back. I won't smoke it again. I walked away from it. That's going to be 1983. This is what? 35 years. I haven't touched a cigarette since. I don't smoke. I don't want to smoke, but I don't want to be around it. Now, I, for the first week, I was like, I'd catch my. But I'm grabbing my pocket where my cigarettes used to be here. I'm putting my fingers up here. You know, I'm in my pocket with my lighter. You know, I'd smoke for probably 12, 13 years. And uh, the Lord said, I want you to use this. This is how you're going to get delivered. I said, yes, sir. First Thessalonians, excuse me, First Corinthians 10, 13. And it says, there's no temptation to come upon you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. And I'll allow you to be tempted above that you are able. But will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And every time I'd go get that cigarette, I'd, you know, no, no, I'd use first drink and ten back then. And it took about probably four or five days to a week. But once I got over it, I never went back. I don't want to. We were in Calvary again last Thursday. It's a friends of ours. Thank you, Joe and Christy. Love you here. They took us over to the cowboy again and we were down in Illinois. My Lord, you walk in, everybody's standing right at the front door smoking. And you're like, ah. couldn't even breathe, man. And he got drunk. Ah. You know, everybody's seven dollars, seven dollars fifty cents over here to get by the rear. I'm just like, you people out of your mind, go to your car and get drunk. <laughs> I mean, seriously, who can pay seven dollars fifty cents for a beer? Now, I didn't want to buy a house for a bottle of water. I'm not dead. I'm not giving you $5 for a bottle of water. But anyway, it reminded me how much I don't need to be in those kind of places. <laughs> I mean, I love, you know, I love people and stuff. But, man, we were in the stand section, and, I mean, I'm standing here, people are all over me. And I'm like, you know, I can't, you know, I'm not into this at all. I mean, I'm just, don't touch me, okay? I love you, don't touch me. And this one dude, he, they brought their kids. Now, can you imagine this on a, on a Thanksgiving? They brought their kids, man, probably five-year-old, and a little girl, probably maybe two or three. And there, him and his wife were here getting drunk. I mean, everybody else was there. And these little kids are having to sit back here by this little table, underneath this table. And all these adults are standing all around and stuff, praising them, using every kind of foul word you can think of. And I'm sitting there thinking, What a way to raise your children. This is terrible. Those kids will know every cuss word there is before they're seven. I'm like, this is terrible. It goes back to what you train your children to do and what you do is what your kids will do. If you go to church, your children will go to church. If you drink, your kids will drink. If you smoke dope, your kids will. I mean, you know, if you love God and praise and worship God, your kids will praise and worship God. It, they're going to do what you do. And the atmosphere you bring in and what you teach them to do 
But here's what's so awesome about that, Pastor Rebecca, is you as a parent are held accountable for what you instill in your son. They just, they, 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 they're going to break my heart, but I've got to give them what's the heart. But it just, it bothers me. But they're, they're lost. They don't know. They don't understand. Their kids will follow in their footsteps and do the very same thing. You might not think if, if, if they become alcoholics at a young age and they have a car accident and get killed. Whose fault is that? Mom and dad's. But it's what mom and dad taught them to do. That, that just, oh man, I don't know if that bothers you, but it gets all over me now. I'm just like, little precious babies, man, have such potential to become alcoholics or drug addicts and just destroy their life. And they had so much potential, and they don't care what they could have done. They might have been, they might have been the, the doctor that cured cancer. They might have been the, you know, the scientist that, that figured out how to tap solar power. Who knows? I mean, it, it's just the problem is. Let's just be real. The problem is, is our selfishness, because we want our way. We want to do what we want to do. We ain't gonna hurt the kids to sit around at the table while we drink and have a good time. Just tell them what's in your heart. You don't really love God. Because if you really love God, you're going to love your kids. There's no way I'd ever love them. You think I'd love you two girls sitting at the table while I'm sitting up here getting crazy watching a football game? There ain't no way. First of all, I think it turns out I'm a stinking pervert since I'm out there all the time. You know? Anyway, I don't mind being out there. That's a different thing. What am I saying to you, parents? Please, please, parents, please. Set a godly example for your children. Please pray before your kids. Please study the word before your kids. Please take your children to church. I mean, I'm just saying, please. Do it because you love them. You might not even like it, but do it because you want to set a good example for them. And instill things in their life because eternity, eternity is based on what those children do with Jesus. That simple. You anything you want to say to me? Why don't you say something and you pray us out of here tonight? Praise the Lord. Thank y'all for coming tonight. And thank y'all for we don't have any questions back here at the end of the text. Love all of you. Thank you for watching on Facebook. Praise the Lord. Good evening, family. This is my sweet uh, um, I'm learning. Pastor Rick's still learning. I am. So, give him a, give him a plug here. Him yeah. Brother Hilton's son, he's with Jesus. He's in heaven. He's already there. But I would encourage you, you can go online, probably go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and you can get the Revelation Teaching Syllabus by Hilton's son. You will enjoy it. Now, you can also go to Miss Billy Brim, to her, uh, uh, Billy and she's got some great teachings on the book of Revelation and prophecy and stuff, too. So, anyway, go ahead. If he could be here Sunday morning, we would be teaching on God and give us a spirit of fear, the power of love, and set on mind. Love you, bless you. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for watching on Facebook. Thank you, Lord. Isn't God good?